Hello, I'd like to share with you a neat story about mRNA processing. Uh, but before we do that, I want to do a simple compare and contrast of uh, the process of transcription in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, looking at some of the similarities and differences. So some similarities here, uh, we have the same enzyme called RNA polymerase that uh, helps transcribe a message from the DNA. And so you see that in both uh, sides prokaryotes and eukaryotes. What's different though is that remember a prokaryote like a bacterial cell does not have a nuclear membrane surrounding the DNA. And so when this message uh, is transcribed from the DNA it is just immediately translated by these ribosomes that are floating around in the cytoplasm. Now <clears throat> the ribosomes uh, serve as like the factory site building the polypeptide chains and this is a uh, individual amino acids being linked together that correspond with the three letter codons of the message and um, those amino acids make that polypeptide which makes the protein and we say proteins do all the work they can be like structural proteins or they can be enzymatic proteins that help do chemical reactions for the organism or the cell <clears throat> and so um, all that is happening simultaneously. Look at this one message has three ribosomes attached to it and they're each making the same protein following the ingredients list in the message. Uh, over here with the uh, eukaryotic cell we have this nuclear envelope surrounding the DNA and so the message after transcription actually we're going to learn that it gets processed. There's some changes that occur to the mRNA before it moves through a nuclear pore and then moves out into the cytoplasm of the eukaryotic cell. At which point either free roaming or free floating ribosomes can link on to the message and start uh, that translation into the protein or uh, the message will link on to the ribosomes on the rough ER, on the rough endoplasmic reticulum side and then of course start making those proteins. All right, we're going to focus on a eukaryotic cell in this story uh, because there's a neat process that occurs uh, prior to the translation phase. So if you look here, now we see that nuclear envelope. Transcription has just occurred where the DNA is read and a segment of messenger RNA is produced from it. Looking closely, though, we have some dark and light shaded areas of this mRNA. And so the mRNA is going to undergo a process called RNA processing, where the light areas have been cut out, and also these yellow uh, end caps are added. So this one over here we're going to learn is called the five prime cap, and this one over here is the poly A tail. After the RNA processing has occurred, then the message leaves through the nuclear pore and goes out and unites with uh, either free floating ribosomes or on the rough endoplasmic reticulum ribosomes. And then the polypeptide, the, the emergence of this new protein is produced. All right, so starting that story back at the DNA level, I want to point out some new items here. On the DNA itself, there's a region called the promoter region. And the promoter region is a segment of DNA that acts as like the starting line. And it's what we call upstream of the important DNA that's, that is actually used to make the message. That message ultimately codes for the production of the proteins uh, in, the, in the later story of translation. And so the start line here, is, scientists call it the TATA box. TATA box is a repeating sequence of TATAs. The, the TATA box uh, serves as a welcome mat for these uh, proteins called transcription factors. And so the transcription factors uh, link on to the TATA box and they uh, serve as the welcome mat for this big enzyme called RNA polymerase. And now it ends in an ACE, so we know it's an enzyme. RNA polymerase's job is to, to step onto the welcome mat and then it's going to race down the DNA and it's going to start producing the message. Um, and the RNA polymerase is able to help like slightly unwind the DNA and then uh, be able to read from inside the segment. Now before we move along, I do want to point out some important vocabulary not to be missed. Notice up here that one of the strands of DNA is called the template strand. The other one is called the non-template strand. Notice that the RNA polymerase, as it races down the DNA, it reads only one strand of the DNA, the template strand. You see here this is called the template strand of the DNA, and so as it unwinds the DNA, it's only reading from one side of it, and then the non-template strand of the DNA is just kind of hanging out on the sidelines. Think of the non-template strand as this like extra backup so that if there ever was an error in one of these nucleotides on the important template strand side, the non-template strand provides a backup copy and um, there are ways that the DNA can help uh, fix that, um, those maybe mistakes made in DNA replication. 
you look a little closer, RNA polymerase here, you can see that it's unwinding the DNA briefly, then it's bringing in individual nucleotides. Remember, there are no Ts in RNA. There's a U replacing uh, the site of where you would expect to see a T on the DNA side. So we're creating this kind of complementary strand of newly made RNA. And we say that RNA polymerase moves in the direction of transcription, building mRNA, starting at the five prime side and working towards the three prime side. So it builds from five to three. On the flip side, on the DNA side, it's reading from three towards five. So it builds five to three, reads three to five. I just try to remember one of those, so I will repeat to myself, builds five to three, builds five to three, builds five to three. Looking a little closer now, that message has just newly been formed. This is what you'll see like in textbooks and so forth. This is the pre-mRNA, before processing, and it has uh, some light color and dark color shades here, which we'll call the introns are going to be the light colors, and the darker colors are called the exons. So what happens? Well, in RNA processing, the introns are cut out, then the exons are welded to get back together. And so this is the uh, finalized message that goes out and then sequences the production of a protein. Some other things occur. A five prime cap is added. Think of this as like the helmet, uh, a hard hat that protects the message so it doesn't get disturbed and it travels out of the nuclear pore. Uh, another thing over here, this is called the, the poly A tail. A length of adenines, nucleotides, are added to the end. And so why is that added? Well, let's take a look back out. The message, after it's been processed, leaves the, the nuclear pore and goes out and then is uh, translated by the ribosomes making those proteins. And multiple uh, ribosomes can attach to it simultaneously, amplifying the production of these proteins. So you can imagine if this message just lingers about forever that the uh, ribosomes are going to have uh, this message to, to link onto and make a lot of proteins and make even more proteins. And if the message doesn't go, doesn't go away, it's going to continue making more proteins. And they just won't stop. And next thing you know, you're going to be like burgeoning full of all these proteins. There's going to be way too many. So we need a way to, you know, essentially turn the message off. Well, another thing that's not shown here uh, out in the cytoplasm are enzymes. Think of them like Pac-Man type characters that go and just chomp apart messages. And the way they do that is that they, these specialized Pac-Man enzymes that break apart the messages start on the end of the poly A tail. They connect here and then they start degrading the message uh, in the direction from the poly A tail first into the coding segment and then just chew all those nucleotides apart. What happens to those nucleotides? Well, they can just freely drift around and uh, these things get recycled. Well, interesting part of the story here is that the poly A tail uh, can have different segment lengths. And so if it has a long poly A tail, it's going to take longer for that um, enzyme that looks like Pac-Man to chop, chomp this apart, leaving the important message around longer for more ribosomes to link to it and ultimately build more proteins from it. So this message is like programmed for self-destruct, kind of like Mission Impossible. And the timeline, uh, how quickly the message will self-destruct, ultimately governed by the length of the poly A tail. Kind of a neat part of the story. All right, so how do we uh, actually process the pre-mRNA? Well, there's this really cool enzyme called the spliceosome, and it has multiple enzymatic sites that can link different areas of that pre-mRNA and pull the exons literally together and weld them together, meanwhile cutting off the splices of the introns, then they get broken apart into individual nucleotides and recycled. One would ask, why would we have introns in the first place? It seems kind of redundant, seems like a waste. Sometimes Mother Nature selects like, the simplest process. Well. Here are uh, some interesting thoughts. One, the same segment of DNA, here are five different exon portions or five different important coding regions of a, a segment of DNA, can be interpreted different ways uh, to produce different proteins. And so the spliceosome and other uh, DNA transcription factors and so forth can produce a recipe for which exons sh should be spliced together in the final message RNA to exit the nuclear pore. So in this example over here on the left, all five exons are spliced together, and the final protein that would be translated and produced out by the ribosomes might look like this. <clears throat> now, the protein's shape has everything to do with its function or its job, and we know that if there's a, a mutation or something that changes the shape, that could ultimately alter the protein's ability to do its job. Well, not talking about the story of mutations here, but what I'm talking about is how the exons can be spliced together in different arrangements, and you end up getting a different shape protein. So this spliceosome uh, would have put together exons 1, 2, 4, and 5, and you see a different shape of a protein produced than compared to the first example. And then 
In our third example, um, the same stretch of DNA could create a pre-mRNA message and then exons one, two, three, and five are left and welded together into the final message and then this protein is uh, of its own unique shape. So the same segment of DNA can ultimately produce several different types of proteins, kind of neat. So there is some wisdom or con uh, conservation to this. And this is something that is an, an area of active research and um, you know it's long kind of been held a belief that the introns were just junk DNA, but more and more clues show that there might be important messages within the introns that could tell the DNA when to turn on or off. Uh, others argue that maybe the introns provide areas for future mutations. Now, you know, 99% of mutations are either nonsense um, or deleterious effect, like a harmful effect. But um, every once in a while, there's a positive mutation that occurs. And so when you think of the scale of numbers, like if a population has a billion members, 1% of mutations or 0.1% of mutations are, uh, could be advantageous, then that leads to improved fitness for the organism. Uh, so two arguments for introns. And again, active area re research will learn more about what introns might offer in future years, I'm sure. All right, well, thanks for listening to the, the cool story about uh, pre-mRNA messaging in eukaryotes.